Hello everybody. The topic for this week is the social contract theory. We had skipped over this chapter last week and went right to utilitarianism and now we are back to pick up the slack. So similarly to utilitarianism, the social contract theory tells us uh, how we're supposed to know what's right and wrong in any given situation. And it's also going to answer some other questions such as why should we even care about morality? Why do we need to worry about being moral at all? And also what makes morality a legitimate thing that we need to follow. So the social contract theory started out as a political theory, much like utilitarianism, and is still very popular as a political viewpoint. And it comes to us primarily from Thomas Hobbes, who's a British philosopher, who is the namesake for Hobbes from Calvin and Hobbes, by the way. Calvin being named after John Calvin, the theologian, and Hobbes being named after this guy. If you're interested in this, I highly recommend you read his book, The Leviathan, which is uh, kind of a necessary read if you're interested in politics and social theory and things like that. So Hobbes asks us to imagine what life would be like if there was no government, no laws, no accountability, no police force, no legal system, nothing like that. He calls this the state of nature. Now Hobbes thought that the state of nature would be terrible. It would be extremely competitive. Everybody would be trying to get the same things, the same resources, which there are limited quantities of, and not everybody could get what they needed all the time because even if you're the hugest person with the most strength in the village, you could certainly be outsmarted by a group of people or something like that. So he thought it would be terrible and nobody would want to live in such a system. Everybody would much rather have there be some sort of accountability, somebody in charge who made sure that everybody was following through and behaving accordingly. So... What happened, what we're asked to imagine, that something that happened was that basically everybody comes together and says, I don't want to live like this anymore with people constantly doing whatever they want to me and my belongings and the people I care about with no repercussions whatsoever. So I agree to give up the freedom to govern myself and do whatever I want and I give it to those people and I allow them to hold me accountable for my actions, provided that everybody else does the same thing. So we basically create the government. We create the legal system by saying, I give up these freedoms and you can hold me accountable for it, but everybody's got to do it. And the thought is, is that if everybody sacrifices a little bit, then we all benefit from it. So if you come and steal my stuff, I can call the police and I can take you to court and pursue legal action. Uh, things like this. Now, um, this is an attempt to explain what makes the government legitimate and why we have to follow the law. We've entered into this social contract. Everybody in society agrees we're going to follow the law and allow the government to hold us accountable because we all benefit when everybody does that. Now, we've talked about how the legal system isn't enough because if we're going to live together cooperatively, we also need uh, there would be moral rules in place uh, against lying and cheating and deceiving and being untrustworthy and things like that. So morality works the same way. We need to imagine what free, equal, rational people would agree to follow, what rules they would agree to follow if they're trying to live cooperatively, provided that everybody else does it as well. So what the social contract theory gives us is an explanation of morality as a social construction. It's just a set of rules that society needs so that it functions effectively and as cooperatively as possible so that we can all live harmoniously and we all benefit when we follow these rules. So a lot of people really like it because of that. Now, that might remind you of cultural relativism, but here's a very important difference. For the cultural relativist, that's all morality is, is whatever your society says goes. And if your whole society thinks that harming others is a good thing, then it is. For the social contract theorist, morality really is just a set of rules that society has in order to function effectively, but it's not whatever society says goes. Instead, we're asked to imagine what free, equal, rational people would agree to if they were trying to have a cooperative society. So it's a sort of idealized version of our own society. So we can say that people like Nazi Germany were wrong because free, equal, rational people would not agree a genocide. And certainly not everybody in that society was free and equal. So we're allowed to say that certain people are wrong. Morality is objective. It's not just subjective, anybody can believe whatever they want sort of a thing like we've seen. 
So that's a big benefit of the social contract theory is we still get to keep this idea of morality as a social construction, which a lot of people like. However, now there's a built-in accountability where people, entire societies, can be wrong about what is morally expected of them. So uh, it also is going to tell us why we should care about being moral and why we have to follow the moral rules. We're in a contract. It's a matter of integrity to follow up with the contract that you agreed to be a part of. It's holding up your end of the bargain as a member of society. You don't want other people to steal from you and kill you or your loved ones, so you can't do the same thing to them. It's a bargaining agreement. It's a contract, and we're obligated to follow it. But it's also going to allow us to have some exceptions in some places. Your book talks a little bit about civil disobedience. This is from the legal side. Now, this is an ethics class, not a political class, but I do hope you understand this idea that sometimes we are allowed to break the rule if we would be better off in the state of nature without the government. Now, they give us the prisoner's dilemma, which is this idea that there's two people convicted of a crime, and if they both stay silent, they both only go to jail for a very short amount of time. If one confesses and one stays quiet, then the one that confesses walks away scot-free, and the one that stays silent goes down for the whole lot of the crime. And if they both confess, then they both get uh, a kind of a mediocre sentence. Now, Hobbes thought that people would confess regardless in this situation, provided that they're not blood-related or in a gang or the mafia or whatever. And he thought that this is because in order for them to both actually keep their promise not to confess to the cops and to stay quiet, they have to have a level of trust between them that it's impossible for them to have. There's no accountability. There's nobody that's going to punish you if you don't keep up your end of the bargain, which is why it's important that they're not in a gang or the mafia where there would be that kind of accountability. Everybody's free to look out for themselves and everybody decides I'm going to confess because I'm not getting stuck with that 10 year sentence and going down for everything if they talk. Now the reason this is a dilemma is because the best possible case scenario overall is if they actually do keep their promise and they do stay quiet because then they each only get one year and that's way better than both getting five. But in order for them to do this, there'd have to be some sort of governing body to hold them accountable. So this is supposed to mimic the state of nature and why we need the government so that we can have this level of trust with our fellow citizens that we can't get if there's no accountability. So we're also allowed to make moral exceptions. So if a, you give a friend of yours a ride to work or to school for a, several weeks at a time, maybe their car's in the shop and you go out of your way to help them out, and then down the line, your car breaks down and you ask them for a ride and they just say no. And there's not really a good reason why they won't pick you up. Well, most of us would feel you're not really obligated to help them in the future if they ask you for a ride because they weren't willing to help you. And the social contract theorists would agree. They have voided that contract with you and said, I don't care about following these moral rules that I'm supposed to follow. And you're absolved from that contract. You're no longer obligated to make them a priority and behave morally with them as you would be if they were maintaining those sorts of behaviors with you. So it does allow for exceptions in some cases, which is a good thing. Also, free, equal, rational people maybe would lie under certain circumstances if you're saving an innocent life or something like that. They probably would allow you to kill in self-defense if the circumstances warranted it or whatever, which is good. And it gives us order and structure in society, which we like. Some of the bad things, though, because there's always bad things. First, we're supposed to imagine what free, equal, rational people would agree to if they're trying to get live together cooperatively, but it's not obvious necessarily what they would agree to because we're not all free, equal, rational people. We've never seen a society like that, let alone live in one. So how are we supposed to know what we're supposed to do in any given circumstance? And what if the free, equal, rational people wouldn't agree? What if they would actually disagree? Then what? Another big complaint is, I never agreed to be in this contract. It's not like when you're born, they give you the social contract and say, oh, do you agree or not? You don't have an option. So even if theoretically we can void the contract and break the law and civil disobedience or not fulfill our moral obligations, we're still going to be held accountable by the legal system and by society because we didn't agree to this. We're kind of bound by the contract and there's not really any way out. Uh, now, the social contract theorists might say, well, you benefit from the contract, so that's like you agreeing. Whether or not you find that satisfying is up to you. 
but be aware of the good and the bad with a social contract theory.